How y'all doing this morning? All right, I'm so glad to be back. My kids actually went to class. It was pretty awesome, huh? My second grader is like super shy, so it's like a miracle in and of itself getting him to go do something like that. So uh, super good to be back here. I really, really am excited. So what we're going to talk about today, God has had on my heart um, John chapter 17. If y'all want to go there, um, starting in verse 20. Now, John chapter 17 is awesome, right? Who's read John chapter 17 before? I'm trying to put my... There's a bunch of powerful stuff in there. Actually, we could probably go through the whole thing. It'd probably take four or five hours. So y'all want to do it? Let's do, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe a few of you. Um, this is really powerful because in this section of Scripture, Jesus is crying out to the Father for, for unity. And um, that's... I guess let you into a little window of John McPeters. That's something that Holy Spirit has put deep in my heart is to see unity among believers in Jesus Christ, to really see the church become united and moving in the power of, of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit going out, setting people free, making disciples all throughout our city, all throughout um, our state, all throughout the world. Um, and I know that we can accomplish that whenever we unite together. And I think that it's, uh, it's beautiful and it's really something deep that's on the Lord's heart. So the context of what's going on here, just so you know, is Jesus is with his disciples. Um, he's, also, he's been teaching them a lot of really fantastic things, telling them he's going to send them a spirit, telling them, talking to them in chapter 15 about abide in me and, and I in you and doing the whole vine and the branches and just all these wonderful truths. And then right before he goes to the garden, and we all know what happens in the garden, right? He gets arrested, he's going to die. So like blazing on his mind has to be, I'm going to my imminent death, right? He knows it's, it's, it's about to happen. And so John writes and shows us this really intimate prayer, this really intimate conversation that Jesus has with Father. And it really shows you the heart. Like, imagine, imagine you know you're going to die. Isn't that great? Let's all imagine that. But let's imagine, we're, gonna, we're in great health, all right? We're old, and we're in great health. We're not going to imagine some garbage. And all your family's surrounding you, all your friends are surrounding you, and you just start talking to Papa God, talking to your father. What kind of things would you talk to him about? It'd probably be pretty important things, right? Things that are on your heart, things that, you, that, that, that really matter a lot. You probably wouldn't be saying, Father, just give me that BMW I've been wanting, you know, for the, my whole life. And you probably wouldn't be thinking of things like that. You'd be thinking of, of the people around you and, and, and of their well-being and all these things. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. Jesus was thinking about his disciples. Again, this is a prayer. This is a conversation he has with the Father in front of his disciples right before he goes to the garden and then gets arrested and then gets killed. So uh, this is really, really powerful. Let me read um, verse 20 through 23, and then we'll break it down a little bit because there's so much richness in here. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's an awesome few <laughs> statement right there that he's, that, he, that he's speaking to the Father. Um, he begins with this really amazing statement that says, I, I ask not only on behalf of these, and who is he talking about? The disciples that were around him, these folks that were all around him, because he's, he, he's talking to the Father in front of them. He's, he's saying, so what we read today, he's saying, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word. So this message today is for all those who believe in Jesus Christ, is believe in the message. And we have the message that these disciples preached and that really sent shockwaves throughout the whole world, the Roman world and then throughout the world, the message of Jesus, the Messiah of God, being 
died and being resurrected to life and giving those who would believe in him life, true life. That message he knew his disciples were going to give, and it's awesome because he says, and on uh, on behalf of those who will believe, Jesus knew this message was life-changing, he knew the message was world-changing, and he knew that there were going to be tons of others who came to know and came to believe that he was Messiah, that he was Son of God, through the words and through the message of these disciples who were all around them. So he could prophetically, knowing what was going to happen, know that there are going to be others who believe And this is my prayer, not only for these who are surrounding me right now, but for everyone. Not only for those who became believers 2,000 years ago, but for those who come to believe in Christ Jesus now for thousands of years. He knew there would be tons of believers then, and that his desire is then for all of us, all of us who believe in Jesus, that they may all be one. That's very, very powerful. I guess that Jesus, knowing man's heart, (laughs) he, he prayed this prayer probably because he knew our inclination to divide. He probably knew that 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 in our hearts very often in man's hearts there's the inclination of pride, of to decide to to go do our own thing or to do that. And so therefore, he's praying to the Father, Father. All of those who believe, all of those who become part of the church. I desire for them to be unified and in one accord. His desire for you, His desire for me, His desire for all of us is that we be completely united because, man, that's the kind of church the gates of hell cannot prevail against. It's the kind of church that changes Murfreesboro. It's the kind of church that changes Tennessee. And it's the kind of church that changes the world. You know, I'm reminded of Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Do you guys remember that story? Did I, do I have it here? Hold up. I'll just, I can turn there in my Bible. I think I actually wrote it down. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Cool. Genesis chapter 11. This is what it says in verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So this was after the flood too, by the way, right? So <laughs> this is, God had already said, man, we're going to do this right and we're going to start with Noah and, and, and we're, this is, this is going to be changed. And then already a few chapters later, we see man going, I'm going to build this whole tower to myself and it's going to go up into the heavens. You see the pride that's in man's heart, right? That, that, that's there. And what does the Lord say about it? It's actually pretty amazing. It says, look, they are one people. And they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do now will be impossible for them. They didn't even have the Holy Spirit of God. They were just a bunch of people who united. And God looked, and he saw the pride in their heart. This is such an act of mercy and grace from our God, by the way. He knew they would destroy themselves if they were allowed to be united in something other than him, in something of themselves, he understood that it would destroy humankind and mankind as we know it. So actually, out of God's grace and out of his mercy, he scattered them all over the world. Plus, if you remember, God did say, be fruitful and multiply, right? Go. And these guys were saying, what? Let's make something to ourselves right here and right now. That was their whole thing. God was saying, no, no, that's not what I desire for you to do. But my point here being the importance is is that these were people who were were not in the church of God, who had not yet believed in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say that they were filled with the Spirit or anything. These were just men, and God said nothing can be impossible for them if they unify together. How much more the people of God unified in the Holy Spirit, his church working and caring for one another and walking with one another, there will be nothing impossible for the church. Nothing impossible. That 
gives me shivers. I mean, just really thinking about how amazing that is. And this is why I know Jesus said, my prayer is that they may be one, because this gospel message is going to go and send shockwaves through the world, and when they're united, it's going to change everything. He says, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us. I'm going to read that one more time. I want you to think about that. First he says that they may be one. Then he says, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us. How much was Jesus in the Father and the Father in Jesus? I mean, when we start to look at this, we see uh, like Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 3, it says that he, speaking of Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. That Jesus was literally radiating God's glory. He was the radiance of God's glory, and he was exactly the imprint. He showed us exactly the character of God. You want to know the character of God? Look at Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Colossians says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the image. He is the exact representation of God. He and the Father were so perfectly united that you could look at him and go, that is God. That is Father. What, is, what happens in John chapter 14? When Philip says, Philip looks at him and goes, he says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. Show us. And I bet he was so excited. Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. This is Philip, one of Jesus' disciples. And Jesus goes, Have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me? Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. Then he says, How can you even say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? Do you not believe that I perfectly represent God on earth and I'm the perfect reflection and image of God? How could you even possibly say, Philip, show us the Father? Jesus is saying, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that tight unity, we're inviting God those who believe in me, in Jesus, to become part. Because it says, may they also be in us. That's an incredible privilege and responsibility whenever I read what he's saying there. He's inviting us to now participate and become image bearers of God to this world. And he gives us the very same spirit he gave Jesus when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, he's not, pr- he's not praying something that can't be done. You understand what I'm saying? He's not, this is, he's full of, Jesus full of infinite wisdom is not praying some prayer that he knows will never be accomplished. He's praying something that he believes that his father will do for him. Whenever he prayed, whenever he spoke to the father, he spoke in faith. He knew it was going to happen. This is This is happening. And this is going to continue to happen. And my encouragement is that we would step in. And if we're running with it, we will continue to run with it. And if we're not, that we'll just dive right in. And that we will become participants in this. Just like I am in you, Father. Just like you were in me. Let them come and let them be with us. And let them reflect this image. Let them be so perfectly united. Let my spirit be bursting out of them so much that the world sees who you are. Is that exactly what it says? That may they also be in us, what? So that the world may believe that you sent me. The world is supposed to look at the church, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, look at the church and go, my God, that Jesus must have been sent from God. Have you seen the way they're united together? Have you seen the way they take care of each other's needs? Have you seen the way they reflect the image of God? There's something going on here. I've never seen anything like it. 
Again, that's an awesome responsibility and an awesome privilege for us to really see. Man, he thinks so highly of us. <laughs> and we think so little of ourselves sometimes. He thinks so highly. He has given you uh, the ability. He has given you, he desires that you would reflect his image and that we would all work together to show the world, to represent him. He could have decided to do anything he wanted, but he chose man, he chose me, he chose you to show the world what he looks like. That's kind of mess, that's messing with that's messing with me this morning. We are to be his image bearers. And as the Father and Spirit and Son are all in one accord, we're to be in one accord. You know the Son, the Spirit, and the Father rely on each other, and they perfectly trust one another. Have you thought about that before? I mean, imagine the trust Father had to give to have Jesus come and to bear his image if he didn't trust that Jesus would walk perfectly, why would he have done it? When Jesus walked up to people and said, blind eyes be open, he had to trust the power of the Spirit that was dwelling inside of him. He so perfectly trusted that he even raised Lazarus from the dead, praying a prayer saying, I don't have to pray this, but I'm praying it for all those who hear me. Because he so knew, all he has to say is, Come. And Lazarus gets up because he is so perfectly trusted the power of God that dwelled in him. They trust each other in perfect harmony and unity. And we are to do the same with one another. To trust the Lord with that, that much uh, trust in perfect unity and to be in that type of perfect unity with one another. That's why Paul calls, it, calls the church a body. We operate together. Our, our hands, our feet, whatever, we have to operate together. And when we do operate together, nothing can stop us. But we've got to learn to trust each other. And that's difficult sometimes. Some of, some of us have trusted others and been hurt in the past. Most of us probably have, actually. <laughs> Honestly, right? If we're just being real. That we've, we, we've given our hearts to something or somebody and uh, we were let down. My encouragement for you all, if that's, if that's you today, is to just believe this word. Believe this word because there are some wonderful people out there that you will not be able to um, be in one accord with if you isolate yourself because of something that somebody else has done to you. There's wonderful folks. And there, there's people here with me today that have, have, are best friends and family members and stuff. And, and I'm so happy that I get to to be friends with them, and I'm so happy that I'm getting to know a lot of you all um, here, but, but I just feel that in my spirit, that there may be, there's some people here that have had, that have had some hurts, and that because of those hurts, and it may have been other believers, okay, we're not, we're, we're only perfect in Christ, we still make mistakes, but because of that, you're, tem- you're timid to jump, to, to get back, to, to, to lay your heart out in four people. But for us to, to take our cities for the kingdom, we've got to risk that. And we've got to jump back in. He says here, along these lines, which is just really powerful. Again, he says, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And actually, if you go down, because he's going to basically repeat himself twice in this little short passage. If you look down at chapter, uh, verse 23, it says, I and them, you and me, that they may become completely one again, so that the world may know that you sent me. And what else does it say? And I've loved them even as you loved me. So our unity together and our representing him, the world, the church is supposed to be distinct. You get that? We're supposed to be distinct. Does that mean that we get up on a pedestal and we go, oh, we're so holy and you're not? No, it's terrible. That's not at all what the desire was. What did, what did knowing the, this awesome truth make Jesus do? Start washing people's feet. It didn't make him get up on a pedestal and to glorify himself. And I am the Messiah. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't do that. There was a time for him to do that. We'll talk about that in a second. But he got down on his feet, on down his knees, and he washed people's feet. But the point being, the, church is, the, peop, the people of the world are supposed to see the church, the body of Christ, and go, Goodness gracious, there's something crazy different about those folks. 
We're supposed to show the world so much, again, I'll just say it again until it hits us in the spirit, that the world looks and goes, goodness, look at those Christians. Jesus must have been sent of God. And then it says, God must love me. The world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So the the love that the Father has for Jesus, God has for this world, Father has for this world. Is that what it's saying? It's saying, (laughs) have sent me and have loved them even as, just as you loved me, Father, you love this world. In that church, my, my body is supposed to show the world that not only am I sent from God, but that you love them just as you love me. Another awesome responsibility and awesome privilege that as image bearers of Christ, they should see us and go, God loves me. Have you seen them? Have you seen the way they, they take care of each other? How they wash each other's feet? How they, how they share lawnmowers with another? Who, how they take care of those who are in need? Those Christians are everywhere. They're loving everybody. They're taking care. They're full of justice and mercy and grace. And, 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 and my God, Jesus must be Messiah. And oh my goodness, he loves me. Because they're taking care of me. Then he says... The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. You ever heard someone go, God does not give his glory to another? You get that, they get that from Isaiah 42 and 48. Um, and, I, and I go back and read it. Read Isaiah, Isaiah 42 and 48. Um, it's. What, if you read it in context, you can take anything out of context and make the Bible say anything you want, right? If you read what he's saying, what he's saying, Isaiah is saying, is that there are a bunch of idols that I will not let you attribute the works of God to. I will not share my glory with those idols. As a good father, I will not let you think that all these good things that I have done for you were done by some stinking stupid wooden idols or silver idols. I will not share my glory with those. Because Jesus right here says, the glory that you have given me. God gave his glory to Jesus. And it doesn't say, and I might give my glory to them. It says, I have given my glory to them. Do you you believe that? God has given, Jesus has given his glory to you and I. And if you look in uh, early chapter 17, Jesus says, Father, glorify me. Why does he say it? That I may glorify you. Jesus knew that he so perfectly embodied, get this, this is good. He so perfectly embodied and represented God. He was such a great, perfect reflection of Father He knew for a fact that when he was glorified, Father would be glorified because he looked just like him. Now, we are to so embody God himself. We are to so be walking in the Holy Spirit, right there with the Holy Spirit, in the power, being direct images, being, uh, showing this world exactly who God is, who Christ Jesus is, that when we're glorified, because he says, I glorified them, Jesus will be glorified. Because we're going to look just like him. And the world's going to say, he is God. We have the glory. And we give him glory through our glory. And it's a beautiful thing. Mm. Father, help us to see. Help us to resonate in our spirits this morning. 
that we are, that we have your glory, that we bear your image, and that your desire is for oneness, unity. Thank you, Father. You see, we divide over such petty things <laughs> very often, do we not? Anybody ever read Heavenly Man, Brother Oon? Anyone ever read that? Oh, goodness gracious, you got to read that. It's really good. I've seen him speak for uh, a couple times. And he's, a, he's a, uh, a big part of the Chinese house church, if you've read much about the Chinese house church and how it's just like taking over China. Um, he's a great, great man. And, and again, it's a great book. Um, once when asked, he was asked, and, and I can't remember what context exactly it was in, um, but he was asked if he prays that the persecution that's within the Chinese church would stop. You know what he said? He actually said no. <laughs> you know why? He says because when persecution gets lifted, we start dividing and we start to glorify ourselves and we start building things unto ourselves. But when there's persecution, we realize our differences are kind of petty. <laughs> whenever it comes to the persecution that's coming around us and that's hitting us. And I say that this morning because uh, I know that there are things that are, how do I say it, that, that, that are maybe challenging or take some time to understand that's in the Scriptures. I get it. And because of that, the problem is, is we've divided so much over so many things. Um, my challenge is what Jesus is saying is that we begin to unite. I wholeheartedly believe, Travis actually mentioned it, I talked to him on the phone, he said, you know what, unity would be easy if we all just listened to Holy Spirit. So he told me, I was like, great. He's right, it would, it would be. It would be easy. But because we, we don't, we make it difficult and challenging. And we fight. And someone posts something on Facebook, and so we just we go and attack their doctrine or whatever. Instead of, like, sitting down, if we just started sitting down and saying, you know, baptism, let's talk about baptism. Let's, let's study the scriptures together. I bet Holy Spirit would bring us. You know what? The people in my life that I've actually done that with, we've come into unity, like, all the time. We really have. I'm, the ones that we sit and we just start studying the scriptures and start saying, what does this really say? It changes the ball game. If we begin to just let Holy Spirit lead and guide us and begin to, to stand on this word and, and to begin to read it, and we can come together instead of going, uh, where was I at? Somewhere here, I saw a sign that said, we're the progressive, primitive, free will Baptist church. I just laughed. And I'm sure there are wonderful people over there. I'm, I'm not making fun of them by any means, but it makes me think like we get, we get to where we're like, okay, yeah, we're we're, prog- we're primitive, but we're not just primitive. We're also progressive. So we're primitive, progressive, and we've got to throw in free will because um, we're not Calvinists, so we're free will, and, but we're about to, you know. And, and it just seems like that's kind of the church in America very often. Let's, let's come together, man. Jesus wants us to be one. And let's come together not only with superficial unity, because sometimes we do that as well, like um, we'll have a unity event or something, which is fine. That's not, that's not necessarily superficial. I mean deep-rooted unity. I want to see deep-rooted. Father, he wants deep-rooted unity, okay? You know what I mean? Not just like one-time events or twice a year we do something that, 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 that provides unity. It's like the church of God is, by the way, it's not just Stones River, right? We've got to see beyond these walls. We have, to, we have to see the kingdom of God beyond our own gatherings. And sometimes it can be difficult because we've been doing it for such a long time and seeing the kingdom of God that way. But seeing the kingdom of God bursting outside of these walls and seeing that there are people in our workplace that we need to begin to have unity and begin to spend time with and begin to say, let's take this workplace for the kingdom of God. Let's start studying the scriptures. Let's start a Bible study. Whatever. Let's do this thing. Let's unite together and see Jesus glorified. Let's unite together and see him magnified. And if we have differences, let's just love each other and pray and go through the scriptures and let's let the Holy Spirit bring unity between you and I. And you know, it doesn't always happen immediately, right? 
You may have a a conversation where you're still in disagreement. It may take a year. It may take two years sometimes, right? It doesn't mean you can't walk with people. It doesn't mean you can't walk with them if somebody believes baptism is essential and someone believes that it's, uh, I'm not exactly sure. You can still walk with these people and talk with them. I know that's tough. I know that's tough, guys. I know that's tough. I think I'm, I'm a, baptism is incredibly important to me. It's incredibly, so it's very, very difficult for me to say. And I know that's tough. Let's walk. Let's breathe for a second before we start going, you're not a Christian, you're not a believer in Jesus, and let's start talking. Because who knows? Maybe your influence changes their mind. Maybe not. But maybe it does. Maybe they have never heard that opinion because every time someone brings it up, they say, you're a hellion. Because no one has actually sat down with them and said, let me show you why I believe what I believe. You understand what I'm saying? No one's ever done that in love and in caring for one another. Who knows, they might change your opinion about something. Travis and I, man, what was it, Travis, like eight years ago or something? I was a charismatic boy, and he was a Church of Christ preacher, and man, we were apart on so many things, weren't we? We had some, we had some discussions. And it's, just, it's, it's awesome to see how, as we actually calm down, and I don't think anyone ever, we didn't really get too upset, did we? Maybe I did at first a little bit. <laughs> he knew the scripture so much better than me. It made me, it, I just, I was just, I was like, dang it. But, you, but that, that, that friendship and love for one another, we can both say there are things that we've changed our minds about because we cared for one another and we decided to be together with one another. And I think that that's, that's the type of love and mercy and grace that Jesus has and that he wants the church to embody. And I want to see that so bad, guys. I, I, I so, and I know that God is moving in, in Murfreesboro and changing people's lives and people are coming into the kingdom. I know it. I will not say that, 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 that for a moment that he's not doing it, but I want to see more and more and more and more of that taking place. And I know I've tried to do it by myself. It's very hard. And Jesus knew that too. There's power in unity. There's power when we set aside our differences and we say, let's focus on Jesus and let's focus on, on, on sending this gospel throughout the city, on seeing people delivered, on seeing people set free, on seeing men and women become true disciples of Jesus where they're passionately in love with him and they're going out and they're making disciples and they're going out and they're making disciples. But it, it will come with unity. I tell you, there's so many people in my life that are encouragements to me that keep me going. That it just really, really is an encouragement when they give me a phone call or we go have coffee or whatever. And we stir one another up. And, and, it's, and it's so, so exciting. And, and whenever I've seen that and I've been able to taste that, I want you all to taste it. Find some people. Find some people. If you don't have folks that, that you've been that, you, that you've allowed in, find some people and share with one another. They were in Acts, they were interdependent of one another. Were they not? They relied on one another. They relied on one another. We're so uh, our society we're such isolationists that that we we will feel like we have to do everything and we have to do it all on our own. And that is not what God desired. That's not what happened in the book of Acts. They had possessions and they would sell things when people were in need. That's Acts chapter two. They were dedicated to the apostles' teaching. They were dedicated to fellowship. They broke bread in each other's homes. And they ate with glad and sincere sincere hearts. They were together every day in the temple, it says. They relied on one another. They encouraged one another. And we can have the same thing. And I know a lot of us do. Let's stand. Can we hold hands together? Just across the aisles, even... Because not only do, there's times whenever we need people and there's times whenever folks need us. You know that? There really is. There's times whenever the doctor comes in and says you've got whatever, that we need others. And we need to be able to call them up and they need to come over and lay hands on us, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. It doesn't happen when we're isolated. It happens when we're unified. 
and we can call him, and it, and it takes place. Father, thank you that you are such a wonderful God, mm-hmm. that you have given us this incredible responsibility and privilege to be your image bearers to this world. I, I, Father, I ask that that would rattle in our spirits mm-hmm. and in our souls this morning, that you've given us this amazing privilege to show the world who you are. And Lord, that we would be faithful and obedient sons and daughters that do just that. That the world would look at us and go, Jesus, 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 because of your characteristics and your spirit bursting out of us, Lord. I pray, Father, that every wall of disunity, Lord, would be torn down in the name of Jesus. That we would stand with our hands held together, united, and in one accord, Lord. And when we have disagreements, Lord, that we would, we would have grace and mercy with one another. And that we would rely on you, rely on you to show us the truths that are, that are, that are in your word. And to show, us, uh, to show us you, Lord, that we would show each other you. Holy, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just you would speak to our hearts whenever we're we're doing things that are causing division. That, 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 we, would, that we would be sensitive to you, that we would be totally sensitive to you, and that whenever something like that's happening, we just take the turn and we'd go back. And we'd have love and we would have unity among each other. Lord, I stand on your word knowing that as we become more and more united. And Lord, not just in these walls, outside of these walls, with other brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters. That we would have that, as we've heard several times this morning, that we would have that reality. We are children of God. We are brothers and sisters. And that we would have unity with them, Lord. And that this city would be shaken. That, you're, that, that the people who drive through Murfreesboro would say there's something different about that city. I just drove through there and I felt something. I saw the people there and there's something different about that city. There are people ruled by God himself. He is their king. Mm. He is their king. Mm. And that's why they're united. And that's why they're together. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Thank you for, the, for giving us that example of what it means to love and to unite, to serve. Thank you that you are seated on your throne in heavenly places and that you've given us the privilege of being your image bearers. Bless your name. In your name that is above all names, we unite together. We say amen.